Well, hello everybody. Danny back from Deep South Homestead again on another porch time. Yes, port time just continues to go. We are, gosh, I don't know, this is year five or six for it. I don't even remember now. But guys, today the weather is awesome. For the last four or five days, we've had the most awesome weather. The mornings, uh, this morning was 43 degrees. It gets up to like 70 during the day. Skies are crystal clear blue during the day. Uh, no chemtrails, no nothing like that. I mean, they're just blue. Uh, now there's something going on at night. I will admit that there's something going on at night because at night you can walk out with a flashlight and it looks like it's snowing at night. And uh, when you hear that banging noise, the squirrels are dropping acorns on the roof again on me. So, um, so that's what that is. You hear that bang ever so often. Uh, but we're having the most awesome weather. The gardens are doing fantastic that we have planted out here. I mean, everything is really doing nice. This is very good weather right now for growing. We're not freezing and we're not over hot. It's just, it's perfect. And I, I will not complain about that. We haven't had this good of weather in quite some time. Now we did, just prior to this, we had that severe weather move through here. And we got three inches of rain in a little over an hour. And boy, I mean, thank the Lord, I've done as much prep work on everything as I did. We didn't have really suffer any damage from it, uh, dirt-wise or anything this time. Uh, you know, we got a couple of places that we're going to touch up just a little bit and kind of take make some new changes there. We've decided that, because there's, guys, the bottom line is this, <laughs> the weather is not normal anymore. I mean, it, it, I mean, I remember as a, as a young adult growing up, even a grown person, uh, even a child, you know, we got bad weather every so often. And it would, we, maybe once a year we get a real hard flooding downpour or something like that. But traditionally, you just got evening rains and stuff like this. The jet stream was very predictable. I mean, you knew it was going to dip down where we live at. You knew it was going to go back up. The, everything was just basically predictable. Farmers knew what to do. Now, it's a toss-up with anything. Nothing is the way it used to be. Uh, I can go out now. We planted, uh, now this is one thing that we, we haven't figured out yet. We planted English peas in uh, one of our high tunnels because we are going to grow them through the winter. We had such good luck last year. We decided, we decided to just go ahead and instead of planting one row of them, we was going to plant two rows of them. And we... Went in there, Wanda did, she planted, and not one seed came up. We went back to dig them up, to, there was no seeds in the ground. We don't know what happened. Uh, we lost about a, about a two week span of growing because we were waiting on them to come up. and So we've replanted, and it does appear that some are beginning to sprout under the ground. So maybe this time we'll get them up. But that kind of brings me to where I want to go today is um, planting a seed. You know, planting a seed, you could use it uh, as, a lot, as a symbolism for lots of different things. Uh, it's spoken of in the Bible a whole lot, planting a seed is. Uh, it can be used in reference to agriculture. Um, it can be used in reference to a train of thought. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways of planting a seed can be used. And uh, in agriculture, you know, we stop and we think about we're in control when we plant the seed. But once it leaves our hands and it goes into that earth, it's out of our control then. Whatever happens to that seed is up to the good Lord above and the elements of nature, whether it sprouts and produces, and this let's use a let's let's look at the analogy of a seed. A seed, in order to have it, you have a live plant. That plant is alive. This the fruit that it bears must completely mature, and then it must die before that seed 
off of that plant can be reused again. Now, isn't that much like human life? I mean, we as people, we procreate, we have children. And, and our children are the byproduct of our being, or we are the byproduct of our parents, let's say that. And once a person comes to a point in life, they begin to bear fruit, and then they die. But their offspring that they produced grows up and begins to reproduce, much like a seed that you put in the ground. The plant dies, you harvest the seed, you put the seed back in the ground, you fertilize it, you give it the nutrition it needs, much like a child, you tend to it, you baby it, you give it what it needs, and it begins to grow and to sprout. How well that plant produces depends on the amount of nutrition you give it. A child, how it comes up in life and how it develops depends on the amount of nutrition that it gets. If it's malnourished, it'll never do good. If it's, if it's nourished properly, then they grow up to be healthy young adults. Same thing with plants. If you take care of the plants like they're supposed to, they grow up to be healthy plants. And I was just thinking while I was working in my garden at the, at the, uh, the similarities between the two um, and the goodness of it. And, and you know, you, you treat that plant right, you give it the nutrition that it needs, and the minerals and all the things that it needs, the proper amount of sunlight and everything, it grows up and it produces an abundant amount. But you don't give it what it needs, and you let it just sit out there and try to fight to hunt food on its own, and it never gets any nutrition in the soil. Well, disease and pests and all this kind of stuff come in, and they take the plant over, and they eventually kill it. And it never really bears much fruit at all. And human life is the same way. If our children come up, and we don't really nourish them, and we don't train them up, as the Bible says, in the way that they should go, um, so that when they're older, they won't depart from it. And we don't really do that, and we just leave them to themselves to watch TV or let the, the system uh, raise them and indoctrinate them. We send them off to what we hope is higher education in college, which is more of an indoctrination thing into uh, evil now. I would, I, if I had kids now, I wouldn't even send them to college. You know, I mean, my, I did send my kids back in the day but I wouldn't even send my kids to college now because of the indoctrination. You don't know how many people we get sending us messages saying, I don't even know who my kids are anymore. They won't talk to me. They won't have anything to do with me. It's like they're, they're not even my children. It's because they've been indoctrinated once they went to college. And, 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 and then, you know, if they don't get what they need and they are indoctrinated in the wrong way, then they grow up to not be productive in a good way. Uh, they get hooked on alcohol, drugs, I mean, all the, uh, you know, illicit type of lifestyles and things like this, and they just never are a productive citizen in the United States. And they always live under the thumb of a government, either a Section 8 home or something to this nature. They just, they're always scrounging for, to make a living, or they live off of mom and dad, or they live off of aunt and uncles, or grandmas and grandpas. They never really have anything or own anything because they were not raised to be productive. They just didn't get what they needed in life. And plants are the same way in our gardens. And the thing, the thing about it is, is we as adults, it is our responsibility to not depend on someone else to do our job for us. Um, like, agriculture. Do you know that used to, when this country was founded, all lawyers, all elected officials, all doctors, all these people, everybody, ministers, everybody was a farmer. Everybody had a farm. Everyone had to have a horse to get around on. In order to have a horse to get around on, you had to have a farm. You had to raise grain. I mean, George Washington had his own farm. Thomas Jefferson had his own farms. I mean, you look at all these 
men of renown, they all owned farms, and it's because uh, they had to have them to survive. They had to be responsible and raise their own food. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson's place was, was notorious for the, the number of different apple trees and fruit trees that the man uh, created. George Washington, I think, was uh, what was one of the famous things that he was accredited for was creating the first, uh, one of the first type grist mills. As a matter of fact, I think it's still in operation today, uh, a circle one, a, a round building where a horse would walk around in that building pulling a thing and tre treading on the grain and the cracks in the floor, it would fall through it. The threshing floor is what I'm trying to say. And um, they would harvest the, the wheat and all from the grain from down below. I mean, these men knew that their life depended upon agriculture. They knew about planting, and it was a big part of their life. Now, they may have hired somebody else to do it, but it was a huge part of all of these type people's lives back then. I mean, doctors had to have horses and buggies to be able to get around on, and somebody had to, you know, somebody had to raise that horse. I mean, they had to have a place to raise it. They had to have grain. I mean, they had to have food for the animal. Somebody had to tend and care for it. I mean, everybody used to be involved in agriculture. If you look at the Bible, probably over half of the Bible deals with agriculture in some form or some fashion. It deals, and the Lord in His explaining things many times uses plant life, agriculture, all this type stuff harvesting this, the, the wheat in the tares. I mean, the stories go are endless. He, he used agriculture throughout the whole scriptures when talking about things. And, guys, we have to understand today that seeds can be planted in lots of ways. Now, the world that we live in today is, I'm just going to say it, it's evil. There, there's some good people in the world today I don't think there's very many, to be honest with you, but I think there's some good people in the world. Uh, I don't think there's any of them in power right now. Very few is in power. I think most everybody that's in power right now is corrupt. Um, and if they're not corrupt, they will be. And so many people today have, uh, we talked about this before, have gotten themselves in a indebtedness situation to where the debt is so deep in their life that... Um, they can't see daylight. And then when something comes along and they make it a, a mandate, and if you don't do this, then you will lose your job. Then And people say, well, if I lose my job, I lose my home, I lose, my, I lose everything, my car, I lose, I, I lose all my insurances, I lose... That's what I'm talking about. Years and years ago, the government began to plant seeds in people's minds through a corrupt thing called television and, and and it has indoctrinated people through the use of commercials to thinking that they couldn't live without certain things I mean our grandparents and our parents we have to stop back and look I mean and I, I, I blame my parents generation and I blame my generation for a lot of the failures in the world today because when better things come along, I remember hearing my daddy say, well, I don't want my kids to have to grow up the way I grew up. I want them to have better than I had. And my dad worked himself to death trying to make sure that we didn't have to live the kind of life he had to live. Now, his, his father was an alcoholic and uh, and my dad never touched a drink in his life, he said. And he, as far as I know, he never did. And he said, I never will. I'll never put my kids through that. And, and, and I appreciate him for that. But he literally killed himself working because he didn't want us to have to grow up the way he grew up and, and live the kind of life he had to live. And one day I looked at him in his old age and I said, Dad... How do you think you turned out in life? He said, well, son, he said, based on the way I was raised, having to go through the kind of lifestyle, he said, I bought land, I paid for it, I owned a home, I owned businesses. He said, I think I've done pretty good. You know, he said, I don't, I'm not bragging, he said, but I think the Lord's really blessed me. 
And I said, well then, let me ask you a question. If being raised the way you were raised was so bad, why is it that you turned out so well? You didn't drink. You didn't do drugs. You, as, My dad in the, in the town that we lived in was classified as an outstanding... Everybody here honored my father and my mother as hard-working people. Every time they, you'd see them say, Oh, it's your mom and your daddy. That's the hardest-working people I've ever seen. They had a good name. The Bible said a good name is, more, is better than rubies or gold. So that was what my dad stuck to that. And I told him, I said, Dad, if all that is... If, if that is how you turned out, then why wouldn't you want us to experience some of the same things in life that you experienced? I said, because it looks to me like the hardships that you faced in life made you have good character. It made you be able to see things that you normally would not have seen. He said, well, son, I just didn't want y'all to have to struggle the way I did. Have to get up every morning. To, at 14 years old, I was out in the woods working with grown men, pulling a cross-cut saw, sawing logs every day till, till dark. And, and he said, I had to do that, you know, till I was able to own my own business when I got older. And he said, I just had to work from daylight to dark the whole time. And I didn't want y'all to have to do that. I said, but did it hurt you? He said, no, it didn't hurt me. He said, matter of fact, I've never been sick in my life hardly. I told him, I said, then why would you not want your children to experience the same things in life? Because it built good character with you. And he said, I don't know, son. He, he would tell me, he said, I don't know. I just didn't want y'all to have to struggle the way I did. I said, well, it looks to me like you turned out pretty good. And I said, the only thing I can hope for in life is that I have followed your advice well enough that when I'm your age, people will look at me and say, that was one hard-working man right there. And his children are good children. That's the legacy I want to leave behind. I want to be able to have that seed that my father planted in me I want to be able to develop that and be able for my children, for people to tell them, now your father, now that was one hard working man. You know, because that's the legacy that a parent should want to leave behind. And I want to be able to plant the seed in my children so that they can plant it in their children. I think that's what happens today. The Bible tells us today that some things, the sins of a father, some things that a father does, the sin-wise, is passed down unto the third and the fourth generation. Now what that tells me is, <coughs> that comes to acres again, what that tells me is that some children that are born The sins of a father have been passed on to that child. Have you, ever seen a, have you ever seen a child that you look at him and go, boy, you can tell he's his daddy's boy. He's just like his daddy. Always in trouble. Always this or always that. Because the sin of that father has passed on down to that child. It's almost like the child didn't stand a chance. I mean, to be honest with you. and it has, It's hard for me to get past some of that thinking sometimes. When I read things like that being passed down, you know, when a father sins. So you think that when you do wrong, you're the only one that's suffering the consequences from it. And that's not true. Because in the Bible, when Solomon, the Lord told Solomon, he said, Solomon, do not mingle with the heathen women from other nations because they will drag you down and they will take you away from your God. Well, in Solomon in his later years, we know that he married into paganism. And in the latter parts of his life, God, t God told him, said, Solomon, I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, I'm not going to punish you because of your father, David. 
I love David. But what I am going to do, I'm going to, your, your children will pay for it. So the sins of Solomon were actually passed on down to his children. Solomon never really had to pay for it, but his children did. The kingdom was rent from their hands. And, but he said, I will always leave a, a seed of David sitting on a throne because I made David that promise. But Solomon's sins were passed on to his children. Sometimes our sins are passed on to our children. My dad made a concerted effort to not allow the sin of his father passed down to him as far as alcoholism. But now he couldn't say that for his brother because it did on his brother. But my dad made an effort to break that chain of bondage in the family. The seed that was planted in him was a corrupt seed from a child, from alcoholism and, 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 and abuse and stuff like this. But he broke that. He planted a new seed in us as his children. And that is our responsibility as a parent, is to plant a new seed in our children so that they're not mooching off of us. They're not living in the house with us when they're 25 or 30 years old. They're off out on their own. I mean, because as a matter of fact, when I got 18, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, my dad's words to me when I was 18 years old, he said, well, boy, what you plan on doing now? He said, I raised you to 18. You ain't staying here with me. You're moving off. You're not living on. And I told him, I said, Dad, I'll, I'll join the military. You know, and that was strictly what I had planned on doing. Um, and then I got married, and, uh, and I came to it. This was the funny part. I told him, I said, Dad, I know you told me. My dad's words to me always was, two, there, two families cannot live in one household. He said, it will not work. Don't even try it. Don't even ask. And, and I came back to him, and I said, Dad, I don't have any land. I don't have anywhere to live right now because I'm not making enough money to afford anything. I said, can I put a mobile home on the backside of your property over here till I can afford to get a piece of property? And he said, yeah, but I'm not giving it to you. He said, you can put it back there for a little while, but you ain't, you're not moving on with me. Get that in your head. You ain't coming over here eating. He said, y'all you, going to fix your own food over there. You're going to raise your own food. And, and he was very blunt about that, very adamant about it. And, and I did. I put, a, I put a mobile home over there until uh, later in life um, I was able to actually purchase our own property and be able to move off and uh, to get started. And, uh, but that's just the way my father was. Uh, that's the way he was raised. And he was very stern in some ways. In some ways, my father was one of the most kind and loving person that you'd ever meet in your life. He would give you the shirt off of his back. You know, he was just that way. But he planted that seed in me. And I tried to convey that to my children. When my daughters got of age, uh, my, my oldest daughter, and when she watches this, she could even confirm to it, uh, she moved out. And I allowed her to put a mobile home on our property back here. And she lived there for a few years until she was able to purchase her own place. And now, uh, I don't know how many properties she actually owns now. I mean, I'm pretty sure she owns more than one property. So she has done well for herself. And that, my friends, is what it's all about. We have to understand that we must plant the good seed in our children. Because right now, the system is planting corrupt seeds. Much like the parable of the sower in the Bible, where some, feed, some seed fell on good ground, some fell on not so good ground, some fell on rocky and stony ground. But the ones that fell on rocky and stony ground uh, soon withered away when the sun came up. Uh, those that fell on decent ground, they bore a little fruit, but those that fell on good ground, they flourished and really bore a lot of good fruit. And that's the way life works in a nutshell. It's all about planting the seed. 
we've got to make sure we plant good seeds because the system that we live in today is evil, it is corrupt, there is nothing good going to come out of it. I'm going to tell you that now. There's no need even looking for anything good to come out of it because it's not going to. We are now in the age of pharmakia in, uh, in Scripture as far as time frame goes. There will be nothing but drug-induced things and evil everywhere we go now. So it's up to us to train up our children and to plant the good seeds in them because Lord knows the world is planting enough evil seeds in them that we can't, we have no control over whatsoever. You, a child can't control what they see 90% of the time. I can't control what I see. If I go to town and I look and I'm like, whoa, and I just happen to see something, I'm like, man, I should have never seen that, you know? But the thing is, as long as we don't keep dwelling on it, if we just turn our heads and, and we go on. That's reading the Bible said, you know, we need to have like blinders. We need to be like a mule. We need to have blinders on. So we, uh, you know, the little story when you teach a kid, uh, be careful little eyes what you see or little ears what you hear. There's a lot of truth to that. And there's a lot of wisdom behind that. It's very important that we as adults, in, I don't want to use the word indoctrinate, but that we plant really good seed in our children so that when they mature they will turn out to be outstanding citizens and be Lord loving people. They'll love the Lord. The problem we have in our country right now is we've raised a generation of derelicts and vagabonds that's running our country right now. A bunch of elitists that literally uh, have had anything they wanted ever given to them, and if they couldn't get it, they stole it, or they manipulated their way through it, or slept their way to the top, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's just evil. There's evil everywhere. And, there's, and the Bible teaches us, take no thought of tomorrow. Tomorrow will have evil sufficient enough for itself. Don't worry about tomorrow as far as trying to change anything that's going to happen tomorrow. Take care of today. Today is all you've got. And if you wake up in the morning and put your shoes on, be thankful. Now, it does, t it does tell us to prepare for the future. The Bible says over in Ecclesiastes, I believe it is, that um, um, a, a righteous man or a just man sees a destruction coming and he makes provisions for it. Uh, if a, if a, the husband of the house had known what hour the thief was going to come, he would have been waiting for him. And the thief would have not have done anything. So we've got to be watchful. We've got to be prepared. We've got to be ready when things begin to come our way. And it is our responsibility to teach our children to be the same way. We've got to plant the good seed in our children to teach them that they also must be prepared for the unseen things in life. You know, we, there's no way you can know for sure everything that's going to happen in life. But as adults and as wise people, it is our God-given responsibility to have enough discernment about ourselves to be able to look toward the future and to be able to say, hey, I need to do this or I need to do that because this is not looking too good. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like sitting back here and you've got $500,000 in a 401k plan and you owe $80,000 for your house to be paid off and you're sitting here going should I pay my house off or should I leave that money in that 401k? That is a, that's a freaking no brainer. Take the $80,000 out. Take the 25% penalty. Pay your house off and then at least you've got a roof over your head. Leave the other in there if you want. Let it, it's going to all go away eventually because they're going to take it. I've already been told they're going to take it all anyhow. But try to put it somewhere into, I mean, me personally, I've done away with 401ks years ago. And I put it into tangible objects that I can lay my hands on. That's my idea of security. You know, um, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you that's what I did.
Uh, everything, I've, I've, I've had mine where I can lay my hands on what I have. Because anything else, let me, let me say this. I know I've gone way over longer than I probably should have. Banking has changed tremendously. Used to, a bank was required, I don't know if you know this or not, used to, um, banks were required to keep 10% of everything that everybody invested into a bank. If you had, you know, if you put $1,000 in a bank, they was required to keep $100 of it at all times in that bank. Well, here in the last, I forgot how many years it's been now, uh, they've changed that. The bank now is required to keep zero of anything you invest into their bank. Uh, the, the authorities have given them uh, the ability now to invest 100% of your money for them to make an income off of. Because basically, let's just be honest about it, that's all a bank does. They take your money and hold it for you because you're not responsible enough to keep it yourself is the way they look at it. And they hold it for you so that you won't spend it on something you don't have any business spending it on. And they take that money and then they go out and they invest it and they make a profit off of it. And then they, give, they make a 10% profit, let's say, and they pay you a 1% profit and to hold your money for you. And then when you go in to, to get some of your money now, they look at you and go, well, now you can't have all of it. You can only have this amount right now. And, you know, maybe tomorrow you can get some more or next week you can get some more. Uh, I ran into lots of this when I built houses for people and they would get draws out of their bank accounts. They would say, well, they only let me have this much and I can't have any more than three draws a month or four draws a month. And I was like, well, I don't know what to tell you. These big bills here has got to be paid. All I can tell you is you better be doing something. You know, so... That's why we need to get ourselves out of debt. And guys, that's what the banks do with our money. They just take it and use it to, to enrich themselves because the world looks at it like we're not responsible enough to handle our own money. So they better handle it for us. That way it can be tracked a lot easier. We can keep up. We can do balances and budgets and stuff like that because most people are just not responsible. And that's the way the system looks at it. Now, I'm not calling you irresponsible. That's what the system says. So... With that being said, guys, i got to get back to work here. It's such a beautiful day. I hate to just not get things done when it's so beautiful outside. But I always love and enjoy taking the time to stop for just a brief moment and come in here for a few minutes while I'm sitting down taking my break and chat with the people that we love so dearly. Thank you, guys, from Deep South Homestead.